tenta criar uma convergência entre o que o John está pesquisando e o que eu venho pesquisando. Né? Na verdade, o John então vai falar sobre... Ele está tentando naturalizar investigações que ele vem fazendo ao longo de vários anos que ele já naturalizou de uma maneira mais computacional no passado e que hoje, então, dentro do contexto do PPG em filosofia da Unicinos, ele tenta é, vincular as nossas pesquisas mais experimentais. O John Bollender tem livros publicados no MIT, é, sobre ciências cognitivas, né, mas num viés mais computacionalista. Né? Além disso, o, o John é bastante especializado na, na, na filosofia e na linguística de Chomsky. Né? E, e faz uma vinculação, então, entre as ciências cognitivas e a linguística por meio da filosofia. Tá? Um dos últimos projetos do John foi é, pensar se dá para naturalizar algumas afirmações do Bertrand Russell né, em relação a descrições definidas. Tá? Hoje ele vai apresentar é, algumas questões é, que avançam em relação a esse projeto de naturalização da filosofia e da lógica de Bertrand Russell. Eu própria não sei ainda uh, tudo que John uh, vai falar, mas uh, então dessa forma nós iniciamos, John vai, vai falar em inglês, né? E eu espero que Bom, depois nós possamos ter uma discussão, se for necessário, algum tipo de tradução durante a discussão. Tem várias pessoas que podem auxiliar nisso, tá? Eu vou, então, depois do John fazer alguns comentários e contribuir com a minha pesquisa ao que ele apresentar hoje. Essa é a proposta dessa mesa, certo? Então, depois nós vamos abrir ao final para a discussão. Eu espero ter, que a gente tenha bastante tempo para a discussão, porque o importante é, enfim, essa interação né, sobre assuntos atuais, recentes, e que são, em um sentido não, é, não científico, são experimentais no sentido artístico. Né? Então, nós estamos aqui tentando avançar em muitos campos da investigação teórica né, de maneiras é, novas, certo? de maneiras novas ainda não, em caminhos ainda não trilhados. Essa é a nossa proposta. Tá? Bom, John. Ok. Well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, um, Today, I want to talk about analyticity, and um, these people are largely philosophers, right? Yes. Okay, well, then you, you know what analyticity is. All right. Yes, no, they are not. So you're familiar with analytic truth. You already know about that, as if there is such a thing. You, know. you also know there's a controversy as to whether there is analytic truth or not. But If there is such a thing as analytic truth, then it would be this. A statement is analytically true, just in case uh, someone can determine the truth of the statement uh, from knowledge of the meanings of the constituent morphemes alone and their arrangement. And uh, of course, I could have said precise morphemes of analysis, right? Um, yeah, and so the. Um, The, um, the more which they get from the lexicon and their, man their uh, manner of arrangement through syntax gives sentential meaning. And, and a truth is analytic, a statement is analytically true if from its sentential meaning alone one can infer that it's true. Okay? 
So you're familiar with that. What you may be less familiar with, and which strikes me as rather exotic, is the possibility that the analyticity of a statement could be revealed using the EEG, you know, the EEG readings. And this is a question. I'm asking the question of whether the analyticity of a statement can be revealed using the EEG, at least in some cases. And it's a little strange to me, but there are some reasons to think that for some sentences, it may be possible. We may That's the point. The EG might be able to reveal at least some of the under and that Yeah. Uh, how a little complex authenticity and denying its existence, but not necessarily all forms of analyticity. So to quote, this is from his um, article, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, a logical truth is a statement which is true and remains true under all of its components other than the logical particles. In other words, um, tautology. Okay? So the logical truths are tautologies, quite continuous. married. Primitive no bachelor is married is not a tautology. It doesn't have a tautology. It's not like saying if Jones is a bachelor, then Jones is a bachelor. Right? It, it doesn't repeat a phrase or a sentence. Yeah. Um, the by putting synonyms for synonyms. Ah, so But the question for quantum and quantum is holistic. It's a property of an entire web of belief, meaning is a property of an entire belief system. It's not a property of individual words or phrases or even sentences, and therefore you can't speak of synonymy. So that was one reason that Quine had rejecting the kind uh, given by the example no bachelor is married such as tautology right, logical truth he was not rejecting that so he was not the claim that the is the form of an analytic truth, genuine analytic truth. And to continue, of analytic statements, the logical truths, but rather in the second class, which depends on the notion of synonymy. So even if you agree with Quine um, in his skepticism with regard to analyticity, that the It does not. You may. Okay. So the top with P 
than P. The question is, can the EEG reveal enough logical form of a, of a sentence to reveal that it has that form, if P then P, for example? Even if superficially, it might not seem to have that form. That's the question. OK. Um, now, intuitively, both of these sentences are analytically true. If John boiled the water, then the water boiled. Uh, now, when you first see that, you might I mean, in and here we see a repetition of the word boiled. So you might think, oh, well, that would be a tautology. And so it would be analytic. And intuitively, it's analytic. If John it's just a matter of logic that it did. Or some. appears to be a transitive verb. It takes a direct object. John boiled the water. John is the agent. The water is the patient. Yeah. But in the second instance of boiled, it's not it, It's a transitive verb. It's not a transitive verb at all. Uh, so. In which case, it might not be. Uh, this might not be tautology, and it might not be analytically true. So, boy, the first one transitive, the second one intransitive, and this would not be a tautology. Maybe. Let And it superficially looks like a tautology. But the first march takes a direct object, the army. The second march does not take a direct object. So these might be two different verbs, maybe not the same verb. Okay? Um, in which case, maybe it's not. The army marches. It's not logically true. It's just something that's obviously true for some empirical reason, I suppose. Okay? So that analytic uh, statements, are they really analytic? Do they really have the form of, of a tautology or not? Now, uh, Yeah, so there is that a that a, uh, a word like break is ambiguous. It could express two different predicates. Okay, so quoting Forder and Lepore, the like I, you know, I broke the vase. Have the structure the break um, connected to or, or merged with a, a causative uh, cause break. Okay. Now, if the same boiled, it would be. Um, the intransitive boiled in both cases, but when you say John, and that's why, because in the case of the water boiling, all you're doing is you're removing the causative particle. It's the same verb, though. 
the water boiled. The same verb. Okay. Um, coming to. And I don't know. So it's a question, okay, not a statement. Um, for example. concept break transitive unless you have the concept of cause but the by adding a causative particle and this is explicit it's phonetic and you hear it okay? so there's no the question is, or whether Portuguese or English are like that implicitly. So here's the description. In terms the Turkish word for die and the word for kill is uldur, and the dur suffix is causative. That means cause to die. Okay. So, in turn, if you say uh, uh, Caesar, wait, Brutus killed Caesar, therefore Caesar died, that would be analytic, apparently, because it's the same verb. Caesar died. Cop means close in the sense of become closed. Kapan means to, to cause to be closed. Okay. And then, um, the thing what English does, right? And maybe, maybe I'm not sure. It's a question. Okay. Now. And uh, so structurally true, okay, has the right. right. So, he means tautologies. The uncontroversial analyticities, the uncontroversial ones, that's what he's talking about. First, uh, so my, my many Exhibit the pattern, one suspects that the share hit. So that's the question. How do we uncover the hidden form? Specifically, even though. And Petrov appealed to theory and syntactic, um, well, a theory and syntactic theory, which is no, which I think might be the best term for it. It's also called small verb analysis. Uh, let's call it hidden verb analysis. It's been. 
the linguist Richard Larson. I think so. And um, but it's been developed by a number of people, in fact. Okay. Okay. about how sentence structure is formed, and more basically, phrase structure. How is phrase structure formed? And here, a bit Russellian, in fact. It's not exactly what I'm going to talk about, but it has something to do with Russell, a little bit. Um, the phrase, what boys eat, is semantically close to a definite description. Um, it, it roughly means, the thing the boys eat, right? Like the King of France or the author of Waverley. Yeah? So All right. So, an attempt to no, or maybe confluir in Tur uh, Portuguese or juntar, okay? and the. So, for example, eat can be combined with um, uh, what to get a verb phrase, eat what? I'm going to grab my umbrella because it's a good pointer. I, I may need to use this. Maybe not now, but in a moment. I, in a moment, I may need to use this. So, um, eat is merged with what, and you get a verb phrase, eat what, okay? Then, um, eat is merged, eat what? I'm, I'll just say a clause, okay? You get a clause. Boys eat what? Okay? Now, then there's a different kind of merge that occurs. Point and the derivation. So the word what, which is the direct object of eat, it can be merged into a superordinate position to get what boys eat what. In this position, the word what functions as an operator. It bonds the earlier occurrence of what, the subordinate occurrence of what. So this is a variable bound by the operator. And it means something like the x, such that boys eat x, or for which x such that boys eat X has both a singular interpretation and a plural. Mm -hmm. Phonetic systems to save energy. They conserve energy by only pronouncing one of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which has to be a different description. Um, and I'm and it depends on which which is nonetheless semantically interpreted as a bound vector. So. of this operation, if you say what they will say has been said before, is an operator, and it binds a variable, which is the direct object of say, but you don't hear it. However, the variable, and it's ungrammatical, 
what they will say has been said before. Even though in other contexts you could contract has onto a preceding word that ends in a vowel, but here you can't. And also because of, well, this trace represents the, the bound variable, right? Also, you cannot insert a, another direct object into this position because the bound variable is already there. It blocks insertion. So that it fits the interpretation that it's a definite description with an operator and a variable. Now, so that march the army into the sea. I'm going to talk about this. The hit okay. if John There are apparent counterexamples. This is a verb phrase, marched the army into the sea. It appears to have two complements, and it appears to be a triple merge. Okay. So linguists wanted to avoid that. So it's really interesting. They came up with the theory that merge is binary all the way through march the army into the sea. It's binary all the way through. But the verb marched occurs twice. So it's in turn, the verb marched first occurs here, and then it occurs here. The reason that it's internally merged into a higher position is because of the causative particle, which in English, like Portuguese, you don't hear. So that's represented by this hashtag, or pound sign, if anyone still calls it that. The hashtag represents the causative. Okay? The causative must attach to a verb. So the verb is moved into a position where it can attach to the causative. And that's why the verb occupies two positions. So a The verb twice, once with the causative particle and once without it. Okay? So when you say the, the wicked general marched the army into the sea, what you're actually thinking is the wicked general caused to march the army marched into the sea. Okay? The wicked general marched the army marched into the sea. So now, logically from this, that the army marched into the sea. Now, the sea. That's an analytic entailment because the army. So it's like saying, okay. and some. The movement upon which occurrence of the verb is modified by an adverb. So if you modify the lower occurrence of the verb by an adverb, that's different from modifying the superordinate occurrence. So the wicked general marched the army madly into the sea. That implies that the army was madly marching which I guess they would have to be. It's a crazy thing to do. But that is motion. On the other hand, up there, then it modifies the superordinate instance of marched. The wicked general madly marched the army into the sea. That implies that the general was doing something mad, which also makes sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but it changes the meaning a little bit. So that's for which means that the second
as a way of showing mentioning Quine. And Chomsky only says that because Quine was a behaviorist, and he would have been skeptical that these trees actually exist in our minds at all. You know, he would have just focused on, on external behavior. You don't see the trees externally. You have to believe that they're in, in the head somewhere. Okay. Um, um, Okay, enough about Quine. Let me just jump down to this part. Uh, <coughs> the hidden verb analysis seems to me empirically and conceptually motivated. It certainly has not been definitively established. And Chomsky said that back in 2003. And I'm wondering... Because it That would mean that, at least for Portuguese or whatever language you're testing, at least if, if the one in he comes. It indicates, um, well, it so, and there's something yeah. that P600 response. So, and tests were also done for German sentences as well. But here are three sentences that were tested. The first does not processing. Emma, the performer in the concert, had imitated a pop star for the audience's amusement. That's easy to parse. But I want to point out something uh, important here. The performer has an agent role here. The performer is the agent. The performer is doing something. And a pop star is the patient. A pop star is the object of this no, action. Yeah. So you have agent, the agent role, and the patient role. And it's easy to distinguish the two in the first sentence. It's harder to distinguish the two in the second sentence. Emily wondered which pop star the performer in the concert had imitated for the audience's amusement. Now, okay, according to twice. You, you hear it right here, which pop star. But which pop star is also the direct object of imitated. Yeah. So there's an unpronounced trace, the direct object of imitated. Yeah. And so what's happening here is that the person hears which pop star, and then they hear the performer. Then they hear imitated. And they have to figure out whether the object right here has the patient role of pop star or the agent role of performer. 
And the answer is patient, right? Because it's the pop star. It's the pop star who was imitated. So at this point, we have to think back to an earlier constituent to interpret the bound variable, yeah? the silent bound variable. Yeah? And at this point, there's an increase of activity. The P600 occurs roughly around here. Because the brain has to work a little bit harder to fill in that gap and assign it the right thematic role, a patient. Or theoretically, that's what's going on. So, um, so the brain actually kind of lights up when there's this unpronounced constituent here. Uh, Emily, another example, similar example, Emily wondered who the performer in the concert had imitated. Now in this case, the word who theoretically was internally merged from this position. You have imitated who. Who is the direct object of imitated and then it's externally merged, or moved, so to speak, into this higher position, right? Uh, to be the head of this determiner phrase. Okay? So once again, the experimental subject has to figure out that the unpronounced constituent has the patient role. Not the agent role of performer, but the patient role of, of who, okay? And this shows up in P600 activity. EEG can be used to provide some P600 occurring roughly around here as the subject has to fill in the missing verb. And if there isn't, is that because the experiment is badly designed or because the hidden verb analysis is wrong? I'm not sure. This is very I'm supposing that, um, that, that there would be no P600, or at least there would be no P600 around this region here. Around here, there would not be. John Boyle, as he angrily watched the news, while the water, which John was boiling, because he's angry, and the water was boiling too. Okay? Very easy to parse. The second sentence is harder to parse. John Boyle, as he angrily watched the news, the water in the thin air. Okay. Now here is a long distance dependency. The water is the object of this verb. So I'm, I'm pretty confident. If there's a verb right here after water, so my question is, might there be two P600s? One, to hear water as the object of this causative up here, and the other, for water to be the subject of the verb boil down here. I, I don't know. <laughs> this is very. interpret the results after the fact.
If you say and so, um, thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, the, the truth is, I I prepared something on background dress, but it's 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 not it's not very near what I was for. I will uh, make some comments and speak a little bit freely here. So we have um, the, we have more questions in neuroscience than answers right now, no? and we have, and uh, we have some experiments we can do as to uh, identify P600 and, uh, or negativities, uh, N400 and so on. Um, the truth is this, uh, these signs appear in many experiments, so obviously uh, there is a, a kind of regularity in our brain functions, but this regularity appears when we are, in, in a sense, expecting something, mm -hmm. and we, these expectations can be very, very different expectations. In, 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 in your proposal, mm -hmm. The expectation would be a, a, a grammatic expectation, a grammatic or or a syntactic expectation. Yeah. But we are not sure exactly which kind of expectation is involved. Maybe it's also a, it's at the same time lexical expectation, syntactic expectation, and semantic, and maybe yeah. maybe also epistemic ex expectation. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the experiments can be, can help us. They can say you are right. Mm -hmm. the The brain will expect something um, at this point when they when they see the first part of the sentence. They will expect. Uh, mm, with more intensity mm -hmm. when there is a, a kind of gap in the words. Mm -hmm. no? When the, the word they, they expect isn't there, but is implicit there. Isn't well, no, well, no? well, in some of these examples, um, if you say, um, Emily wondered who the performer of the concert had imitated for the audience's amusement, the, the person here the word who. Not the well, no, because it, it would sound funny. I mean, I mean that, that would be surprising, actually. Emily wondered who in the performer of the concert imitated who for the on his amusement. You know, but um, why would it, so he's not expecting to hear it or to read right, it right. in a screen, but he, uh, the person is, uh, why should the brain react? Uh, well, to <coughs> the person knows there's a direct object there. They don't hear it. So you don't hear who. But it is who, right? So the brain has to do some work to connect this location to this earlier word and not this noun, performer, or the performer, not that, or the concert, for that matter, but with who. So that, that extra work shows up okay. in the brain. Oh, that's how um. so, yeah. no, uh, 
I would uh, make the same comment. Uh, this, the comment is we still don't know exactly. Uh, uh, to we can differ, uh, make differences between which kind of work is being done. That's the, the that's my my comment. Mm -hmm. Okay, because uh, for example, Chomsky could say, okay, when we detect that the brain is working in a more intense way, when it mu is relating words in a mm -hmm. sentence, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. or is filling gaps in a sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Chomsky could say that to, to try to prove that grammar is um, something um, innate or something that we have before I don't know before leaning if we do that with infants of a certain age maybe um, well yeah if, if you don't hear all of the constituents but you you mentally represent them anyway um, then that's a kind of poverty of the stimulus that's not precisely what I was thinking of not the question of innateness but just the question of analyticity yeah. Yes, but um, from a Quinean point of view, mm -hmm. um, every structure should be learned in, a, in some sense. Okay. So, uh, because he said, he said, I'm not uh, defending, but he said, uh, logic could change. Right. In every culture, um, <laughs> well, not every culture, it but like, it could change. It sounds like late Wittgenstein, doesn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it could change. Uh, obviously, um, we we have some proofs right now that we react similarly to learning in in all cultures, but to learning language learning in all cultures. So mm -hmm. there are similarities through cultures, trans. There is a kind of um, sim similar grammatical structure in every language, but <coughs> but we don't know yet what is really similar and what not. So that that could be a good question. From well, a Chomskyan point if of we, view? If, if we test on Portuguese speakers, or actually Brazilian Portuguese speakers, it would really be a test for whether there is an unpronounced causative in Brazilian Portuguese. It'd be specifically a test for that. It would not apply to all languages. If the Pitahan language in, in the Amazon really is as exotic as some linguists or, or one linguist thinks that it is, then I would not necessarily expect the data to be the same for the Pitahan language. But it, it, um, if there's an unpronounced causative in Portuguese that's analogous to a fully you know, phonetic causative in Turkish, that's interesting. It's like finding like, um, it's almost like convergent evolution. It's like finding a, 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 a similarity across a wide evolutionary gap, you know. Um, and that, that might provide some insight into how the mind works generally. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I would say I, I was um, I I was writing on um, not on Russell's uh, logic, but on Russell's empiricism and philosophy of mind. Mm -hmm. And I would like to try to relate a little bit with what you are proposing because of neuroscience. Well, okay. internal merge may underlie definite descriptions on some level, as I mentioned early on the, early on the talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly what I was planning on talking about, but yeah, there's... Yeah, I mean... And generative grammar is the result of internal merge. And so um, internal merge may be crucial for definite descriptions if they involve bound variables. Okay, I, I would like to 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 ask something uh, 
more less specific, John, less uh -huh. specific, in the sense when we 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 have these signs in EEG, what we receive is mixed. Mm -hmm. The information we receive is not clean in the sense that uh, it's not pure because we 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 make hypotheses on what exactly uh, caused caused mm -hmm. these signals and these changes of signals mm -hmm. of potentials. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we we don't know exactly what all kinds of capacities are involved mm -hmm. when we do this, for example, this merging or this kind of filling gaps in grammatical structures. Mm -hmm. And from a, an empiricist point of view, we could say, but that's very broad, I, I know, we could say that we need many capacities. We don't need just syntactical capacities. We need, for example, to understand. So we need semantical capacities at the same time. And we need, at the same time, no, maybe not epistemical at, the, at this point. Maybe we don't need to identify if the sentence is true or false. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. But we need to understand yeah. the meaning mm -hmm. of the words and of the of the of many words together, not maybe of the whole sentence, or maybe of the whole sentence that we are expecting mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. at some moment. Mm -hmm. So um, what we don't know yet, and what I, I, I think uh, linguists and neuroscientists are, are trying to, un to get, to understand, is which kind of capacities are involved in this kind of um, syntactical abilities syntactical um, merging or syntactical mm -hmm. filling gaps or yeah. so on. Yeah. So, because you won't see just, I, I, I don't know which area they say they, they identify in the brain mm -hmm. that's more active at the, when people are filling these gaps. <coughs> uh, we know that many areas are active when some tasks, some, some uh, linguistic tasks are, are, um, are being e executed. So um, so my, my question would be, if we locate some areas that are more active during some Task, linguistic test. Yeah. Which conclusion could we get from that? Oh well, one thing you'll find in these papers is that when they, they offer, they, they have they give data from um, these experiments, and then they offer an interpretation of them. Then they immediately say, well, there might be some other interpretation. So what they do is they try to come up with an, a new experiment that would eliminate like alternative interpretations, so they get to get down to to try to get down to the, the best explanation. So we don't I guess it'd be something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, <coughs> in relation to semantics, of course, you can't really, syntax and semantics are, are very closely related, but in the way that syntax is a bridge from lexical semantics, so the individual lexical items have meanings, there's also sentential semantics, that's the meaning of the sentence. And syntax is the bridge from lexical semantics to sentential semantics. So for example, these two sentences consist of the same words. Um, but um, I mean, the wicked general madly marched the army into the sea. The wicked general marched the army madly into the sea. The same lexical items, but they're merged differently. So the syntax is different, and that changes the meaning. 
So that illustrates the point of the sem sentential semantics depending upon um, the syntax plus the lexical semantics. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. it's not ignoring semantics. So, so. maybe there is a, a link between this kind of investigation research and what Russell was thinking about the content of the, the semantical content of words. Well, if, if some words are defined using definite descriptions, uh, as dis according to descriptivism, mm -hmm. so if Venus means something like the evening star, or if it's a cluster of descriptions, the evening star, the morning star, and something else. Um, and if definite descriptions are the result of internal merge, then there could be a, internal merge could play an important role in our defining terms, our defining new terms. One thing I could have talked about is how definite descriptions, our ability to form definite descriptions may be crucial for our capacity to define new terms. So it, it enables us to, it makes conceptual innovation possible. That, that's one possibility. As I understand it, that's what David Lewis believed. And if internal merge is necessary for depth descriptions, then you need internal merge for conceptual innovation. And if internal merge is unique to humans, then conceptual innovation would be unique to humans. That's a possibility. I, I, I thought about uh, perceptual content, but, but this is another. You, you, are, you are trying to, to think still when you have already uh, established meaning. So not, yeah. not that you are establishing meaning at this point. You, you, you already know the meaning. Well, that knowledge by description presupposes knowledge by acquaintance. Yeah. Ah, so That's what I'm referring to. Yeah, so, yes. so like, you are um, presupposing. We, we can define terms for, the, for unknown things using terms that refer to known things by means of descriptions. Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. That's probably closer to what you expected me to talk about, I guess, <laughs> rather than this. But, yeah. but another time. I mean, if we could okay. if we could find some way to test this here, that would be um, that'd be fun, I think. Thank you very much. Oh, John. thank you. And <coughs> now I open to, uh, to questions. Okay. okay. So one, two, three, four. Okay. Adriano, Ricardo, Guilherme, César. Okay. Uh, thank you for the discussion. <coughs> it raised lots of questions. And I'm, uh, what I would like to try is to explore a little bit in terms of the philosophical background we have had because of the philosophy we have been doing in the last century. So I was wondering, our model was logic. And John started with logic, analyticity. And let's try to uh, check if EEG can give us how we process the structure of anal analyticity. But at the end, what we have, and because of your question, Sophia, it's, it, it, came up, it came up something very different. Uh, we are now checking our brain activity. And you mentioned that Quine says, and he said that logic can change. But perhaps our brains doesn't change in the way, in, in a sense that our brains are made to work in a certain way. So my exploratory question is the following. We want to analyze the way we think, and now we are trying to analyze that brain activity, why we pro in which way we process information. 
and I'm pointing out to the difference. It's, it's not the same. It's, uh, we've been using a structure which is highly abstract, but when you decompose this in natural language, you see that perhaps logic is too abstract. It's, it's an abstraction of, of, of natural language. But what we got in, in EEG is not the logical structure behind our language, but it's only the brain activity behind the way we process language. Uh -huh. And that would be a much more reliable view into our deep structure of language than logic would ever thought it could be. I don't think well logic done. since Frege was even supposed to give insight into language. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, but in Russell and, and Frege, I don't think it, that it even was supposed to do that. I mean, that, Oh, that's tricky. That's very tricky, actually. <laughs> but Frege between logic and psychology, at least. Definitely. And, and here we are talking about psychology to determine whether the sentences are analytic or not. Yes, so so, so uh, I might say that we're committing some kind of category mistake and making a terrible yes, exactly. error. exactly. This is what I'm saying. I'm saying that because we've been using logic as Frey con yeah. uh, conceived it to uh, analyze natural language. So we use it to analyze phra uh, 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 phrases on a, a, a natural language. But now what we are saying is that perhaps psychology can explain us more how we process information through language than mm -hmm. logic could have done. So it's just a provocative yeah. question. Then a I kind of logic. Huh? OK, Quine has many critics. Well, very much. that the, the, the classical logic could be reduced or explained by a naturalized philosophy or something like that. And just one more thing, the, the rule would be, in your ana uh, analysis, uh, uh, it's a support for this rule, is that? Uh, 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 actually, Adriano, is your microphone on? I, I think it is. It is? But, but it's, <laughs> the microphone is just for taping, it's not for you to hear. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I have to, to be louder. Okay. Is that our brain? The rule is less energy. Use less energy. So be economic. Yes. It's all about economy and uh -huh. not about structure or whatever. Be econ economic. And there is a result. It uh, was uh, published a month or two months ago, telling us about uh, exactly about the, uh, uh, this that all languages uh, could be. You must know this, this rule. Uh, in every language, we could measure uh, the proximity of language using this rule, be economic. That brain trying, in every language, they're trying to bring the referent closer to the, import, the important part of, of the Oh, language. yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah that, that, that sounds familiar. So, yeah, uh, yeah you, so, you, you, you try. Like complex long distance dependencies, but but also to actually, but but to explain why you don't pronounce marched down here. Theoretically, marched occupies this position as well as that one, but just to save energy, the phonetic system. These are token identical, theoretically. Token identical. Um, so um, the and the, they're not token identical. They're two distinct tokens. But this is token identical to that. And, that, and so the phonetic system just pronounces uh, this token in one position just to save energy. But, uh, They will instances. Uh, 
once. Um, Expecting a P600 uh, after in the second token of the verb March. That's right. Uh, yes, because uh, if the hidden verb analysis is correct, there is reason to suppose that uh, the second token that is hidden will be processed and uh, will have a more uh, Synthetical demand or effort, and assuming that the P P600 is correlated with synthetical uh, difficulty integration, we have reasons to expect a P600 in sentences like this. But uh, uh, if we create an experiment and we have two conditions, sentences of this kind with hidden verbs and sentences that mirrors this structure, but the first that they yeah. have not. That's what the hypothesis generate a difference Normally. of the results. Yeah, that's why I suggested this, but <coughs> in what We have reason to respect a peak 600, but we can see a difference that is significant, even if it's not a P600, like uh, the semantical component, the N400. When they created the experiment, they had huh. all the reason to expect a positivity at 300 milliseconds, yeah. and they found a negativity at 400. So they found a difference oh. even if they were not expecting it. But we can uh, do this kind of experiment and even find uh, a difference. Well, <laughs> See what happens. No, no. I don't know. Very complex structures, yeah? <coughs> okay. More questions, Guilherme? It's really a naive question. Uh, there seems to be, to be intuitively, some kind of difference, difference between jo John Boyle the water and the general march the army into the sea. Uh, in the sense that, in the second case, in the case of the general marching, you can always imagine otherwise. You know? The general march, the, the, I don't know, maybe that's because I'm not, not a native speaker of English and then I, I, I tend to, to interpret this uh. in a slightly different way. But you know, I think that it would be, it would make sense if the, the, the sentence was like, the general marched the army into the war, but the army didn't comply. You know, but it, it well, well, I think if the general marched the army, then the army marched and is like boiled. But you think? Yeah. yeah. Like really crazy to obey that order. But The two conditions of the, the sentence would demand that the army did march. Ma and the 
adverb around the, the meaning changes. Um, I thought, <laughs> rather than the general march the army into the sea or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but my maybe the English speakers don't agree with me, but that, that's what it seems like to me. In other words, it, he succeeded. The, ar the army did it. And a suggestion or I don't know. You mentioned that analysis yeah. says that internal merge blocks further insertions. Internal merge well, I mean Yeah. The, the, there's something you said something like this. The internal merge blocks further insertions. Well, I got the idea. Yeah. Maybe there is an EHD opportunity right here. Something like to design and to run an EHD to measure effects of uh, forbidden insertions. Let's see what happens. Yeah. You get some... What? Right. It's deep. So it sounds very strange. What <laughs> Some kind of brain activity there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. If there is a general rule says that the, uh, the internal merge blocks for the insertions, the, the EEG should show some difference. Yeah. It could be a uh, useful data. Yeah. That's a, the idea I got, the suggestion. Uh, okay. So if you could say that, oh, keep the ESO. That sounds deviant. Because the ESO is in a position that's occupied by the, by the bound variable. And that's not really possible. <laughs> so your brain can't really process it. You know, or your brain like views it as like kind of jumbled or mixed up and kind of wonders what the person's really trying to say. Yeah. Well, I, in and they were shown one word at a time. I believe that, that's that's correct, isn't he, Carter? They were shown one word at a time. That everything temporarily. You think that would work better? It should be possible to do that. It, sh it should be possible. I don't see why not. Yeah. The, the important thing is to control the timing so that you know when each word is being perceived. So thank you very much. Thank you.